Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. I will bless your name for bringing us together once again. Lord, we pray as you open the pages of the scriptures, revealing your mind to us. Lord, we pray you grant us the grace, the heart, the attitude, the courage, the conviction to obey your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you give us serious minds looking at your word and it's still contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And that, Lord, young and old, children, youth, men, women, adults, old timers and newcomers will come at your word and understand that what you want is obedience to your word. Help us, Lord, to demonstrate that respectful attitude towards your word and be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Then the, the blessing of obedience will come to every one of us. Great will be the prosperity of your people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. This morning we come to the word of God and we're looking at God's plan for your own prosperity. God's plan for prospering you. What does he demand of you? What does he want of you? What is he asking of you? So that you will be prosperous. He promised the children of Israel. He gave them a lot of promises concerning their prosperity, concerning their progress, and concerning their success. But he gave them the condition. Many years passed by. And they were not fulfilling the condition of prosperity the Lord had given them. And because of that, poverty came unto them. And if there are believers today that are wondering, why am I in this condition? Why am I poor? Why am I deprived? Why am I not having what I ought to have? I look at the promises of God. I match them with my life. And it's a wide difference between the promises of the Lord and the situation in which I find myself. The question is why? The Lord is answering that question why this morning and the Lord wants us to make a U-turn and to say, the things I knew not before, teach thou me if I have done anything wrong, if I have acted in a way that brings defeat and sorrow and a poverty to my life, oh Lord, I'm willing to change and what will change? then the blessing of the Lord will be upon our lives in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye you have gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Here the Lord challenged the children of Israel, and the Lord can challenge the whole church today. The church at large, the church in the world, and our church in particular. What happened to the children of Israel is that they brought in a lot of ideas that had not been commanded by the Lord. And then they elevated and exalted those ideas and practices above the word of God. And then as they relegated the word of God to the background, religion still continued. And still following the Lord as they said, everything still continued, but they were not keeping to the word of God. They relegated the word of God to the background and their tra tradition and their culture. And whatever they wanted, they brought to the forefront and the Lord accused them and the controversy with them. Even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me. The Lord was not giving up on them. On the other hand, the Lord was not yielding to them. The Lord was not saying, okay, that's all right. If you're not going to obey that, what do you want? If this is what you want, I will then return to you. I will do what you want. And then I will have to be your servant. And then you will have to be my Lord. God said, no, not in any way. He said, you will have to return. That's why he calls us to repentance. He calls us to return unto his way. Return unto me, and I will return unto you. We take that first step 
I return unto the Lord. And it says, We return unto the Lord. He will return unto us. He says, says the Lord of us. But he said, Wherein shall we return? And then he brought out something to them. The place where they had gone away from him. And we can say about our church here too. That in this area, many of us, it's like, Oh Lord, give me this and give me this and answer my prayer and prosper me. But we have turned away from the Lord in his prosperity plan. Look at verse 8. When a man robbed God, yet he have robbed me. But she say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. For the children of Israel, it was in their tithes and offering. For us, many people, tithes and offering, time and treasures, skill and ability, we will draw it away from the Lord. Our strength will draw from the Lord. And then everything that the Lord had given us to honor His name and to glorify Him, we take that away from the Lord. And the Lord says, You have robbed me. Then He says, You are cursed in verse 9 with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And you know, sometimes there are people that follow the majority. And if the majority is doing something, even though that thing is wrong, then they say, the majority cannot be wrong. If the majority is doing it, then I can do it here. But the whole nation was wrong. And the whole nation had robbed God. And God said, even this whole nation, you have robbed me. That millions of people are doing something wrong doesn't justify that thing that is wrong. That millions of people are acting the wrong way doesn't approve that thing that is wrong. All these people, the whole nation, they wrote God and that a church is doing something wrong does not mean that that thing is acceptable. You know, sometimes you have a whole denomination. That whole denomination doesn't think about what about teaching. When people give their lives to the Lord, they just continue. No water baptism. That the old denomination is abandoning water baptism doesn't mean that they are right. Sometimes it's the Lord's Supper. That the whole church is not taking, uh, taking a care of. That the old church is not doing that doesn't mean that they are right. They're still wrong. And when a whole nation, a whole church, a whole denomination is abandoning something, that doesn't mean that then God is going to say, well, I'll forget about that. I'm not going to talk about water baptism. I'm not going to talk about the Lord's Supper. I'm not going to talk about this or that because the whole church is not uh, doing it. You know, sometimes it's evangelism that the whole church is abandoning. And then they bring in some things into the church. They're not necessarily bad things or wrong things. They're just not in the New Testament. And they put the emphasis on them. And the New Testament does not put the emphasis on them. And sometimes when a church is like that, the church will not know when they abandon the thing that the Lord wants to do. I told you yesterday in the morning that I find singing in one passage of scripture in the whole history of the church, Acts of the Apostles, and I went back home to check up again my concordance. And I saw that that is true. In the whole of the Acts of the Apostles, you find Paul and Silas sang. There was no choir in the New Testament. And yet, choir is all right. Choir is not wrong. If we put the choir in the appropriate place, what I'm saying is we bring in the singing. We bring in the choir. And then we relegate evangelism to the background. And then the singing, which is not in the New Testament, becomes the in thing. The thing becomes the appropriate thing and becomes the greatest thing in the church. And the evangelism becomes something that we neglect and nobody is talking about that. And that the whole church is going that direction doesn't mean that the church is right. And when the church discovers that the emphasis of the New Testament is going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then we say we are coming back to that. There are some people that instead of earnestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, they want to earnestly contend for the singing, for the choir, for this, for that. But this is deeper life, Bible church. We are going to keep to the Bible. I said we are going to keep to the Bible. And it is when we join hearts and hands together. And we say, this is what the New Testament says about planting a church. 
about growing a church, about maintaining a church, and we put the right emphasis on the right thing, then we're able to move forward. And this, this, uh, the children of Israel in particular, they abandoned the way of the Lord. And then now it says, You have wrought me in tithes and offering. Look at verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And put me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The Lord is saying, turn around, make a change. And it is as we make that change and we come back to the Bible and we place the first thing first and then all the other things will follow. And then we have appropriate portion of our time appropriate portion of our treasure, appropriate portion of our skill, appropriate portion of our money. And we give what belongs to the Lord unto the Lord. Then the Lord says, He will bless us. The Lord will bless us. I said, the Lord will bless us. Then He says in verse 11, really then I will rebuild the devourer for your sakes. And ye shall not, and they shall not, ye shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all the nations, all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. That reveals to us God's prosperity plan. We're going to follow that plan. And as we follow that plan and we put forth what God puts forth, we put to the background what God puts to the background. We exalt what God exalts. And then we trample put on the feet what God says He doesn't want. It is then His prosperity plan will come upon our lives. And look at that passage. I divide to three points. Number one, the problem and the poverty of the unfaithful. The problem and the poverty of the unfaithful. And the Lord used a particular word. Look at verse 8. Will a man rob God? The word rob, that means to steal. Will a man steal from God? And then he says, for yet ye have robbed me. You have stolen from me. And he said, but he said, wherein have we robbed thee? Wherein have we stolen from you? And then he says, in tithes and offering. You have not given me what belongs to me. You are stealing from me. You are taking something away from me. Is it possible to steal from God? Of course, yes. Of course, yes. Is it possible to take something that belongs to God and then bring it to ourselves without taking it to God? Of course, yes. Look at Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Stealing from God. Are you stealing from God? The honor that belongs to God. Are you stealing from God? The glory that belongs to God? Are you stealing from God the tithes and offering that belongs to God? Are you stealing from God the time that belongs to God? Are you stealing from God the majesty, the exaltation that belongs to God? Are you stealing from God the position that belongs to God only? It says, they robbed him. They stole from him. Joshua chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 11 and verse 12. Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. When the Lord commands something, and then we rob him of obedience, the stealing in the sight of God, and then we do what he has not commanded. We emphasize what he has not commanded. We give our life, our time, our attention to what he has not commanded. We plan and program what he has not commanded and then we abandon what he has commanded it says they have sinned and transgressed my covenant which i commanded them for they have even taken of their cursed sin and have also stolen that's the word is stole they stole and dissembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff now, do you realize the story we're reading here? This is about Achan, and it's actually Achan alone that stole, but his family knew about it. Other people knew about it, and he just kept quiet. They supported the thief. They supported the one that went against the word of the Lord. You know, sometimes it's like that, that's just an Achan. is doing something wrong. 
and then the rest of us instead correct instead of correcting the Achan, we're supporting the Achan against God. And we're defending the Achan against God. And we're covering up and concealing that Achan against God. And God says now because of that, Israel has sinned. The whole nation had sinned. They have transgressed my commandment, which I commanded them. They have evil taken up their possessing. They have stolen. Look at verse 12. It says, therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. You see, we are the people that destroy ourselves. Israel destroyed themselves. They should have been the greatest nation on earth. Which they shall be the first power, world power, all over the world, and in all their generations. But they were the people that relegated themselves to the background, not God, not even other nations, not even the nations around them. They were the cause of their own defeat. And many people are the causes of their own defeat. It says, these people, they will not be able to stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy their cursed sin from among you. There are people that instead of making the correction, they will say, well, God will forget about you. It is temporary sin. Disobedience is not a temporary sin. It's something that God says, you have to correct it. You have to turn around. You have to repent. As you return unto me, only then will I have favor upon you. But starting up, sanctify the people. And say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel. There is an accursed sin in the midst of you, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye have taken away the accursed sin from among you. That means what they have stolen, they need to return, restore unto the Lord. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. The controversy that the Lord had with the children of Israel and the controversy still has with people today when we are not in obedience to the word of the Lord and when what God has commanded, we don't want to take care of that. He commanded tithes and offering and he said, bring that into my house that there will be food in my storehouse. And then he says, I will bless you, says the Lord of hosts. And when we don't do that, and we're holding and holding it back, and keeping it what belongs to the Lord, he says that is the reason for our problem and poverty. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 11 verse 24. Proverbs 11 verse 24. There is, there is, that, there is that scattereth, and yet increasing is giving out and giving out and yet is increasing and then it says and there is that which which holdeth more than is meat but it tendereth to poverty is holding back what you should give to god the time you should give to god is holding it back the talent you should give to god is holding it back it's stingy with god it's not giving things out and it tells us here there is that withholdeth more than is meet. Is keeping back more than is necessary. It should give one tenth to the Lord and then keep nine over ten for himself. He's not doing that. And then he says he tenders to poverty. He comes to poverty. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 7. Proverbs 13, verse 7. There is that maketh himself rich, yet has nothing. He maketh himself rich, yet he has nothing. He's holding back his money, holding back his tithes, holding back his offering. Do you realize there's a difference between tithe and offering? There is tithe, one tenth of what you have. There is offering, the free will offering, what you add. And there are people that only give offering. They don't give tithes. And the offering they give is maybe about one over hundred of what they have instead of bringing 10 over 100 that is one tenth they just bring a little if you have brought your tithes and offering today to the house of god you want to worship the lord with your tithes and offering then they will squeeze uh, maybe some little amount of money that cannot buy anything then they raise it up and they say they are giving tithes and offering it says they're withholding from the lord there is that maketh himself rich 
yet has nothing. There is that maketh himself poor. He's giving unto God and giving unto God and giving unto God. He maketh himself poor, yet has great riches. He's saying that when you are faithful, when I'm faithful, when we are faithful unto the Lord and we give what belongs to Him, He says, then we make ourselves rich. Haggai chapter 1. In Haggai chapter 1, we're looking at verse 10. Haggai chapter 1. In there, let's read uh, the verse before that and the verse after that from verse 9. Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 11. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, here is what it says, telling us what we have to do and telling us what our responsibilities are in the sight of the Lord. It says, He looked for much, and lo, it came to little. He said, You have been looking for much. And then eventually it came to little. And when you brought it to him, I did blow upon it. Have you noticed the way that, you know, people uh, react to their situations in life? If there is poverty, they say Satan. If there is scarcity, they say Satan. If there is a famine upon them in their family, they say Satan. If they have certificate and they don't have job, they say Satan. If they are working so hard and they have nothing, they say it's Satan. And God is saying here, no, this is not Satan. You are my people. I redeemed you. I gave my only begotten son so that you can be saved. I washed you in the blood of the Lamb. And I made a covenant with you. And I gave you so much. And you're not giving anything back. He said, that's why I did that to you. You're not showing gratitude, appreciation for what I've done for you. That's why I'm doing this to you. Look at verse 9 again. He looked for much, and lo, it came to little. When he brought it home, I, the Almighty God, did blow upon it. He said, it's not Satan, it's he. And as you look at your life and you see how you live, just, you know, you don't give your tithes and offering to the Lord. You don't give your time to the Lord. You don't give your skill to the Lord. You serve Caesar more than you serve God. And you serve Caesar with more, with more faithfulness more than you're serving the Almighty God. You serve your manager, you serve your director, you obey your manager, you obey your director. You're punctual, you give all the time, you pay your tax to the government, and you ought to do that. But are you very careful and meticulous about that in your company? Because you know that they're going to check up. And they're going to find out if you're not paying your tax. And therefore, the things you want to import, you'll not be able to import because you don't have relevant document. You do the right thing. All the things the government is asking, you have to do that. And yet, but you're not having the same, the same faithfulness and loyalty and commitment unto the Lord. It's a business you have exalted the people of the world above me. That's why I did blow over what you got. It says, why? Says the Lord. Because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man to his own house. He said it's because you didn't honor me, you didn't honor my house, and because of what you have done, you have neglected my house. That is the reason why I blew upon everything you've got. Look at verse 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is staged from dew, and the earth is staged from her fruit. In verse 11. And I called for a drought. Almighty God said, I'm the one that did it. It's not Satan. It's not demon. You know, all these people that do not read their Bible and they're talking about generational curse and, you know, the curse from the village and curse from this and curse from that. And the Lord is saying, you're looking in the wrong direction. Open your Bibles again and see that it's me that did this unto you. And I call for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the, all the labor of the hands. And that's why many people come to poverty because they have not, they have not looked at this a problem to say we are at fault. We didn't give what we needed to give to God. We didn't give it to Him. And because of that, that is the reason why this calamity and this poverty has come upon the people of God. But the Lord is in return. The Lord is in return. And as we return, the blessings of God will begin to flow again. I thought you were saying, Amen. 
And you know, we're not just sending the word of God just to hear. We're not just reading just to read, but to read and do it. But to hear and do it. I want to recollect all our ways and to say, yes, this is the reason why all these problems have come upon me and upon my family. And then return unto the Lord. Let's come back to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, I'm reading once again from verse, I'm reading from verse uh, 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me. Return unto me. You know, it's not just to fold our hands and then to say things will change. Things will not change until we return. Oh, things will improve. Things will not improve until we repent that he wants us to give him the honor that belongs to him and the glory that belongs to him and the time that belongs to him and the treasure and the money and the tithes and the offering that belongs to him he says return unto me and i will return unto you says the lord of hosts but then you say wherein shall we return that brings me to point number two the principle and the practice of the faithful wherein shall we return wherein shall we return it tells us where to return verse 10 bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse what is saying everything i commanded and i said this is mine bring it back to me everything that belongs to me bring it back to me and we're talking about tithes and offering but you know it's not just tithes and offering i want to show you something in in second the king in second the corinthians chapter eight second corinthians chapter eight i'm reading there from the swan second corinthians chapter eight from verse one moreover brethren we do you to wait to understand and to know of the grace of god bestowed on the churches of macedonia paul the apostle writing to the corinthian church he said i want you to notice something about the church in macedonia what did, what did he notice about them how that in a great trial and affliction of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality you find something the natural about them number one trial number two you find affliction and then number three you find deep poverty but all these people did not give any excuse because of our deep poverty and because of our affliction and because of our trial we cannot do anything about this we cannot offer anything to the lord you know there are people that they say they are poor and because of that they cannot render anything to the lord other people i don't have any talent i don't have any skill i don't have any money i don't have anything i can give to the lord of course you have you have and you find people in the bible days in their poverty they gave to the lord and it is because of that giving to the lord their poverty was taken away do you remember the woman that was gathering sticks so that she'll cook the last meal and die and then elijah the man of god was sent unto her was not sent to the rich was not sent to the he likes he was sent to the people uh, to this woman that had nothing and then Elijah said, can you give me a cup of water to drink over there? And the woman was going for the water. You know, she would have said, water to drink? Where is our God? Where is the God of Israel? And you are a prophet. Where is the God of Elijah? And where is, you are telling me to give you water. I cannot give you water. And I begin to complain. No complaint. And it is when you look at your life with everything that you think is there or not there and you're still saying i'm going to give up my very best unto the lord even though i seem to have nothing and while she was going the man of god said can you bring a cake in your hand also because i need to eat and then the woman said i have nothing man of god i'm just cooking the last meal so that when i eat that meal then i will die with my son and the man of god said go and do for me first let God be first, not you. Let God be first, not your family. Let God be first. And then you said, because the cruise of oil and the barrel of meal shall not waste, shall not, shall not cease until the famine is over. 
And she went and did what the man of God had said. And then she ate, and the child ate, and the man of God ate all the days of that famine. I pray that that same pattern and that same principle come back to our lives in Jesus' name. And then we will have the blessing of obedience upon our lives. Look at verse 2 again. It says how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and the deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Are you like that? To your power. Everything you've got to your power. And then it says to the beyond your power, above your power, it says you give of yourself. You know, that's what the Lord is expecting, not to say we're calculating with God, we're stingy with God. If I'm happy, I'll give a little. If I'm very, very happy, I'll give much. No. It says that they want beyond their power, in their liberality. Look at verse 3. For to the verse four, rather praying us, pleading with us, begging us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They were begging, you know, when the apostles were saying, No, you're too poor to offer this, this is too much. You don't have work, you don't have job, you don't have any resources, and to give this, this is too much. They said, No, they were pleading, Please don't allow me to miss my blessing. I need to give this, I need to give everything I've got, so that as I give everything, then the Lord will give all that He needs to give back unto me. Look at verse 5 and this they did not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves. First, they gave of their own selves to the Lord. They gave of their own selves to the Lord. And you know, there are people that bring tithes and offering grudgingly. Okay, that's what God wants. I give. They don't give themselves. Their hearts are not there. Their minds are not there. Their energy is not there. All their zeal is not. Everything they've got is not. Okay, that's what you want. Okay, get and let me rest. God doesn't appreciate that. He loves a cheerful giver. And he said, these Macedonians, look at how they gave. He said, they gave first of their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave themselves to the Lord and then he said, we cannot see the Lord face to face. We cannot see him in the natural. And you are the representatives of the Lord. We give ourselves unto you as we're giving ourselves unto God. In so much, in verse 6, that we desire titles. That as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as she abound in everything. Not only tithes and offering, in everything, your time. Your heart, your mind, your knowledge, your training, your ability, your skill. It says you will give everything in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us. See that ye are bound in this grace also. See that ye are bound in this grace also. Verse 8, I speak not by commandment. Or by the occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. What you give shows the sincerity of your love. How you give shows the sincerity of your love. The time you give, the talent you give, the money you give, the tithes and offering you give, it shows the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, Yet, for your sakes, he became poor, that through his poverty, ye might be rich. That's telling us then that if you are going to be like Christ, we'll say, though you are rich, yet you give abundantly, and you give sincerely, and you give everything you need to give, so that through your giving, you make yourself poor to make the church, the kingdom of God, rich. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. 
and you'll see what the Lord Jesus Christ commented on concerning the giving of a particular woman and this is even going beyond tithes and offering and if you cannot give tithes and offering one taste of what you have how can you give more time if you cannot give your tithes and offering how will you be able to give all your training all your treasures yourself and your family everything you got for the propagation of the gospel the lord is telling us that we need to give tithes and offering and we need to give everything that we have got because he has given everything for us and given everything to us and it is by that giving that we're able to come into the kingdom and we're saved because jesus died for us he gave his own life without sparing anything and he's telling us that the way jesus christ has given himself to us we need to show gratitude and say oh lord because of what you have done i'm going to do this as well that through his riches he became poor so that we can be rich in the grace of god and can be rich in the things of the kingdom look at chapter 21 of luke luke chapter 21 verse 1 and he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury he looked up and he saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury you know there are people that they would say that whatever your right hand is doing don't allow your left hand to do many people they confuse the scriptures and what the lord is saying about men about women that is when you are giving to a beggar when you're giving arms to people you don't want to publicize that you don't want to blow any trumpet you want to do that secretly but then when you are giving to god god is not a beggar you're not giving arms to the lord when you're offering yourself to the lord hey, you're not offering something that you know you say i don't want anybody to know this i'm going to be faithful to god i'm going to be loyal to god i'm going to be obedient to god but i'm not going to allow anybody to know about my faithfulness no i'm going to i'm coming back to that luke chapter 21 but why don't you look at why don't you look at matthew chapter 6 and this is that you know people they stay on the cover they, they, they misunderstand the word of god misinterpret the word of god and misapply the word of god and say yes tithes and offering i'm not going to give my tithes of offering so that people will not know of course people ought to know and god ought to know look at matthew chapter 6 it says in verse 1 take each that she do not your arms before men. Arms. This is not tithes and offering. This is not giving to God. This is giving to man. Giving to beggars. Giving to the poor. That you do not your arms before men. To, to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thy arms, not tithes and offering, not giving in the church when you do your arms when you're giving to the man on the street and you're giving to the beggars and you're giving to the poor people in your community it says therefore when thou doest an arms do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men verily i say unto you they have their reward but when thou doest arms 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 like you know the man that sat at the beautiful gate in acts of the apostles chapter 3 and then he was expecting that the people who are going into the synagogue into the temple will give him arms and he said when you do that do not let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth that thine arms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly give me a good amen there but now we're coming to giving in the church giving unto god not arms putting your treasure into the treasury give me your tithes and offering look at chapter 21 not luke chapter 21 from verse 1 and he looked up 
and saw the rich man casting the gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites, just two mites. A poor widow. She didn't say, I'm so poor I cannot give. I don't have anything I cannot give. You know, many times as we announce in the church, we're building a new church. And we're evangelizing. And we're going around to do saturation church planting. And because of that, we'll need locations for those churches. Because of that, we'll need a new place there, a new place there, a new place there. And we need to give of our money after paying, after giving the tithes and the offering. We need to give much more than we have been given before. Oh, there are some people that will say, well, they're talking to the rich people. I don't have anything. What do I have? Only two mites. What do I have? Only these two fathers. What do I have? Only a small provision. The Lord is saying, is talking to the whole church because the gospel is giving to the whole church to give to the whole world. That's why he's saying here, this poor widow, a certain poor widow, casting theater, two mites, and then in verse 3, and he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. Why that? Look at verse 4. For all these have are for their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she, of her penury, she, in her adversity, she, in her poverty, has cast in all the living that she had. Jesus took note of that. She gave 100% instead of 10%. Instead of just tithe, she said, I cannot divide this. I have only two mites. How do you divide two mites into ten and give one tenth unto the Lord? Instead of saying, well, since I cannot divide it, I am going to hold everything to myself. He gave, she gave everything she had got. And because she gave all her living, Jesus commented about that. And the Lord Jesus commended her. That's what the Lord is saying to us. He says, you bring your tithes and your offering. And then it's not something you say, I'm giving it in the secret. There's no secrecy here. And there are some people that will say tithes and offering. Hmm. Isn't that a kind of, in the law. And then when the law was abolished, then tithes and offering became abolished. Not really so. Tithes and offering had been before the time of the law. And because it was before the time of the law, when the law came and the law was totally abolished later, the tithes and offerings still remain because they have been there before the time of the law. We're looking at Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, reading from verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High, God. Melchizedek, when you come to the New Testament, Melchizedek actually represented Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace and the King of Righteousness. He tells us in verse 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be Abraham. He says of the Most High God, and then God is the possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20. And he blessed the most high God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hands. And he, Abraham, gave him tithes of all. He, Abraham, gave Melchizedek, the one that stands for, and the one that represents the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Abraham giving tithes of all. That shows us then that tithes and offering is not something that the law has abolished. It came before the law. We're looking at Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28 verse 20. In Genesis 28 verse 20, And Jacob vowed a vow. This was before the law. How did they know? Well, you are going to discover that in, the, in Genesis, before the law came, 
they knew the word of the Lord. First of all, you understand that they knew that they shouldn't worship idols. How do we know that? Because when God called J Jacob and he said, Come back unto me and come back to Bethel, he told all his family, He said, Get, get all your idols and hide here and bury under the oak tree. They knew they shouldn't worship idol. Not only that, respected their parents. How do we know that? Because what Reuben did against his father, the curse came upon Reuben. And what one of the children did against Noah, the curse came upon that child. Why? Even though it was not the time of the law, they knew that you honor your father and your mother. I about adultery. Do you remember when somebody said Tim has gone to commit immorality and now she's pregnant? What did Jacob say? She must be burnt in fire, in fire. Because even though it was Genesis time, it was still the law of God reaching in their hearts. The same thing, tithes and offering. It had been there from the time of Genesis before the law came. You read that verse 20 that Jacob vowed a vow before the Lord saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. He said, I don't need to be rich before I pay my tithes. All I need is just clothes to wear, raiment to put on, and food to feed me, bread to eat. He says, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. That's the number one thing. If a sinner is just paying as an offering of what use is that? If you've not given your life to the Lord Jesus of what use is that? If you're not a child of God of what use is that? He said, the first thing. This God will be my God. He'll be my father. He'll be the one. He'll be my redeemer. He has created me. I'm going to give my life to the Lord. He's going to be my God, my redeemer. Then he said, and this stone which I have set for the pillar shall be God's house. Shall be God's house. It's, listen, we're not reading Exodus. We're reading Genesis. In, in Exodus, is why I said it shall bring all this and build the tabernacle. The law had not come, but even at that time, Jacob knew we need to have a house of the Lord who can worship God in. And he says, This stone, this place, I'll make a pillar here, and this will be God's house. And then he said in verse 22, And of all that thou shalt give me, of all that thou shalt give me, these are sincere worshippers. These are the people that really know God. And they don't need message upon message upon message upon message before they did it. Abraham did not hear any message about us and offering. The Lord painted it and pointed it in his heart that this must be done. Jacob did not have a pastor, a teacher, or a self scripture teacher to say, pay your tithe, pay your tithe. And did not attend a retreat or conference. But then he said, of all that the Lord shall give me, I will surely give the tithes unto thee. That means then when you're a real child of God, he puts that in your heart. If you're grateful to God, he has saved you. If you are grateful to God, you belong to the Lord. If you are grateful to the Lord, that you are a real child of God. If you are grateful to the Lord for what he has done, you say, I'm going to give up myself. This God will be my God. Not only that, of all that he gives me, thanks will I give unto him. Leviticus chapter 27. Now during the time of the Lord, the Lord just affirmed what the people had known before the time of the Lord. The Lord just affirmed what had been there before the law came. It says in Leviticus chapter 27, we're looking at verse 30. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. And all the ties of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's belongs to the Lord. On the time of Genesis, it belonged to the Lord. During the time of the Lord, it belonged to the Lord. And during this time too, it still belongs to the Lord. And it says all, all. And that's why we're emphasizing that everything we've got, not just your money, your time belongs to the Lord. Your strength belongs to the Lord. You serve the Lord with the strength of your life. And then it says, because it belongs to the Lord, it is holy, it is dedicated, it is set apart unto the Lord. 
How did he do it in the New Testament? Let's come now to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Then you understand what the Lord is telling us about our responsibility. In fact, when the Holy Ghost came upon the people in Acts of the Apostles, they went beyond Genesis. Of course, they are true. Saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God guiding them into all truth. Now they went beyond what even happened in Genesis. And when the Lord has been favorable unto us, He has saved us. When the Lord has been favorable unto us, He has healed us. He has taken away all our affliction, broken our yoke. He's given us a place in heaven. In my Father's house, how many mansions? If you want us, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And when the Lord has gone to prepare a place for us, He's given us something on earth, and He's given us something glorious and beautiful in heaven. Of course, that's what we're going to do. You're going to go beyond the time of Genesis, or beyond the time of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You're going to go beyond the time of the prophets of the Old Testament. You say, now this is what I'm going to give. Look at it, 9. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. And I'm reading here from verse 32. Acts of the Apostles were reading from chapter 4 and verse 32. And the whole and the multitude of them that believe of one heart and of one soul. And they, they agree together in the doctrines of the Bible. They agree together in obedience to the word of God. They agree together as to giving their totality, everything they've got unto the Lord. And it says the multitude, there were many, and yet they were united. Men and women, young and old, as many as they were, they were united on the word of God. And on their sacrificial giving unto the Lord. It says in that verse 33, and then it says, Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. Everything they had, they gave. Not just one tenth. The Lord is saying one tenth is what he commanded. But when the Spirit of God came upon them, and the Spirit of God began to flow in their midst, leading them and guiding them into all truth, it says they never thought anything they had belonged to them. That everything they've got, since God has given everything, and has given His only begotten Son, they said, now, everything we've got, we have to give unto the Lord. Look at it in verse 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. The work of God did not lack. And the people of God did not lack because of what they were giving. And because of their faithfulness unto the Lord. That time has come again in our church in Jesus' name. Our church will not lack. The district churches will not lack. The churches and the local governments will not lag. And the churches and the regions will not lag. And the church in any nation will not lag in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. And you know, sometimes uh, there are people that don't understand, uh, don't understand, especially when we send missionaries to a particular country, maybe an African country, and all the members there, they don't understand. Once you are born again, you come into obedience to the word of God, and you come to the obedience of returning to all the totality of the revelation of the word of God. Tithes and offering included. And you want to build a church over there in that African country where you have a missionary. You bring your money. You bring everything you've got. And you contribute as well. Not just waiting for another person, another person at the headquarters to come and build the church for us there. Because the word of God over here says in the church, in the early church, everyone, whatever they ask, they give. And we're going to give in Jesus' name. It says, Neither was there any among them that lagged, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses. What's the next word? I said, What's the next word? They sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Even when they did not have literal money, currency, what they had, they sold. How these people loved the Lord. And I pray that our love for the Lord will be real in Jesus' name. Then it says, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet. That's, you know, this is not talking about left hand, not knowing what the right hand is doing. They laid them. They made them available. The apostles knew, of course, 
they laid them down at the apostles' feet because they were not giving uh, arms to God. God is not a beggar. Let's say, for example, you are giving something to your father and say, so I'm going to give this to my father, but I don't want my father to know because my left hand must not know what my right hand is doing. And your father is saying, what do you mean? I'm not a beggar. You're giving something to your children. And then you say, I don't want my children to know this because I don't want my left hand to know what my right hand is doing. And your children say, Mommy, what are, you talk, what are you talking about? I'm reading the scripture that my left hand must not know what my right hand is talking about. And the children are saying, you mean we're beggars? You're giving us arms? You're doing your duty. You're a father, you're a mother. And because your father and mother, you are doing what you ought to do. The same thing when you are children of God and you are giving something to your heavenly father. And then you are giving something to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are giving something to the church and to the church where you are feeding. You are not saying, I am not going to allow people to know this. I am not going to allow the pastor to know this or my leaders to know this. It says, they brought everything down and they laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to every man according as he had need. Look at verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was so named Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, have been learned, sold each. We have testimonies of people in our church when we want to do some a great project, a big project, and we're building a local church, or we're building our a Bible training center, IBTC, or we're building uh, over here at a DLCC, and then people don't have anything. They sell what they have. Is that foolish? Of course, it's wise. That's the wisest thing you could do because when you do that, what about the testimonies of the people? They give everything they've got, they sold everything they've got, and the Lord bless them. And those days of blessing are coming back again. I said they are coming back again when you give to the Lord abundantly, unselfishly, and cheerfully, and sacrificially, or He gives back unto you. We are told about this Barnabas here, the son of consolation, having learned, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet, at the apostles' feet. They were not doing anything secret here because they knew they were giving it unto the Lord. We're looking at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, the Lord is reaffirming and confirming that practice that started in the Old Testament, in Genesis in particular. And the Lord is telling us, This ought ye to have done. Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithes of meat and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Let's stop here for a moment. You know what the Lord is saying here? The Lord is making comparison between one, two, three, four, five things. That means then, as you look at your Christian life, and the Lord is saying, yes, I know what you're doing. There's some people who give tithes, but then they, they omit the weightier matters of the law. And there are churches that will give this and give that, and they omit the weightier matters of the law. Let's come back again. Repetition is necessary for emphasis. Let's say, for example, on the one hand, we have singing in the church. On the other hand, we have evangelism in the church. And the Lord is making comparison. Oh yes, the singing is all right. The singing is all right. But you have omitted the weightier matters of the law. The evangelism is greater. The church planting is greater. Let's say, for example, you put singing on the one side, and then you put the teaching of the Word of God. The Word of God that will help people to be saved and to be sanctified and to be filled with the Holy Ghost and then to be prepared for heaven. Then we're concentrating on singing and then the teaching of the Word of God will really get to the background. Sometimes they invite me to some churches and they give one whole hour to all their singing and drumming and dancing and rejoicing and hallowing all those things. And then when the time of the Word of God comes, they don't have up to 20 minutes. They're tired already. They're sweating already. They're singing, it's all right. But then the first thing 
the important thing, the witchier matters of the Lord, they relegate to the background. And the Lord is telling us that you are doing this and that like the Pharisees, but you have omitted the witchier matters of the law. And what we are saying during this retreat, emphasizing during this retreat, that those witchier matters of the word of God, we are bringing them to the fault, and forcing will be forced in Jesus' name. Give me a good day. Amen. If you are in agreement with me as a church, I need an amen. You know, one of our brothers was preaching yesterday and he was emphasizing the very fact that now we're planting new churches and some people are saying, but where will they? There's no choir to be able to go around. And he reminded us, do we need choir to go around in every local church we're planting? No, we don't. Just I'm emphasizing to you that in the Acts of the Apostles, they planted churches and Philip went to Samaria. There's no choir there. There's still a church. And so the Lord is telling us that Good things are good, but the weightier matters of the law, we're going to bring them to the front and first thing will be forced in our lives and in the church in Jesus' name. And another amen I miss over there. Look at verse 23 again. I'm emphasizing this. You know, all this I can do without even talking about it at the headquarters church here. But I want the churches in the states to hear. I want the churches in the regions to hear. I want the churches in all the nations to hear that the emphasis of the church and the emphasis of Christ is the word of God. That's why I'm saying it directly so that everybody will hear. And when we begin to make the changes in the Lagos church at the headquarters church, I will Put the word of God as number one, that people will know when they overhear that this is what we've done. They know the reason we have done, why we're doing what we're doing. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of meat and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, that's justice, mercy, and faith. This ought she to have done. And not to leave the other undone. That is the tithes and offering. That is essential. That's important. And yet the which here matters of the law. Justice. Righteousness. And faith and mercy. We ought to emphasize that beyond the tithes and the offering. Of course beyond the singing and all the other things. We're coming to point number three now. The promise of prosperity. The promise of prosperity and Fruitfulness, the promise of prosperity and fruitfulness. Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. The promise of God. And I pray that the promise of God will be yes and amen in our lives in our church in Jesus' name. When we do what He wants us to do, and when we obey the word of God, as He wants us to obey the word of God. The blessing of God is going to come upon us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Where are you? I said, praise the Lord. And you know, look up here for a moment. You know, sometimes there are people that when any of that were preaching, they judge the preaching. They say, well, I see the world and I see the seas that are reaching there. But you know, my problem is I don't like the way it is presented. Hey, why don't you like the way it is presented? It's like Jonah came to Nineveh. And Jonah said, and yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You know, if the king of Nineveh said, well, we understand, but I don't like the way Jonah is expressing what he's saying. And then all the counselors and all the people that are following Jonah, they said, I don't like the way that Jonah is saying what he's saying. And he went about just saying the same thing over and over three days. They took the first day and the Nineveh shall be overthrown just for 40 days. Went to another place, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people, they believed the word of God. They accepted the word of God. They didn't judge the attitude or the, uh, or the kind of approach that Jonah was taking. Don't judge the world. Your pastor is your pastor. And when your pastor decides that this is the way to emphasize something, the first day and the second day and the third day, and who knows, I might still emphasize that in the new year. You say, praise the Lord. I didn't get it yesterday, but I get it today. We should have the right attitude to the word of God. So it's not when we're prostrating and begging that we're going 
going to obey the word of God. And the king of Nineveh stood up and then told all the people, here is the word of God. And we're going to obey the word of God. And when the Lord saw that they turned, when the Lord saw that they changed, and he gave their lives to the Lord, then the blessing came upon them. And as we give ourselves to the word, the Lord is going to bless us in Jesus' name. Malachi chapter 3, now I'm reading from verse 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and that there may be meat in mine house. And put me now here with, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It says, the reason is told us to bring the tithes and the offering and to bring everything we've got onto the storehouse is so that his blessing will come upon us. And he says he'll open the windows of heaven. The Lord will open the windows of heaven. On the basis on the condition of obedience to so the word of God, on the basis on the condition of turning around and being obedient to the word of God, He'll open those windows of heaven, He will bless us abundantly. Verse 11 And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit. Before the time in the field, says the Lord of those. That means all the destroyers, all the things that are taking away our harvest, our prosperity, the Lord will send them away from us in Jesus' name. In verse, in verse 12, and all the nations shall call you blessed. They will see the blessings of the Lord upon our lives. Because of obedience and returning to the Lord, then the blessings will be so much that all the nations around, they will see we have been blessed of the Lord. And he shall, and he shall be delight some land, says the Lord of hosts. Proverbs chapter 3. In Proverbs chapter 3, obedience brings blessing. Turning to the Lord and giving ourselves to the Lord and giving our resources to the Lord like he has commanded. It brings blessing and it says when that blessing comes then the people will know and all the nations of the earth will call us blessed. In Proverbs chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. In verse 9, honor the Lord with thy substance. You know, you see that? When we give to the Lord our sources, we are honoring the Lord. You give your time to the Lord, you are honoring the Lord. You give your talent, your skill, your ability, your training to the Lord, you are honoring the Lord. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. It says the first fruits of your increase. That is, as you are trading, as you are working, as you are laboring somewhere, you are having some, you are having some income. It says you honor the Lord with what you have got, and so shall thy bands be filled with plenty. That's talking about the prosperity that comes upon the people of God when they honor the Lord with their substance, and thy presence shall burst out with new wine. Job chapter thirty-six. The blessing that comes when we're obedient to the Lord. Obedience brings blessing. Job chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 10. Job chapter 36, verse 10. He opened also their ear to discipline and commanded that they return from iniquity. That's the commandment of the Lord. And that is what he desires. That is what he demands. He says, we should return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. He tells us that if we're going to have the blessings of the Lord, the prosperity of the Lord, then we're going to have to obey the Lord, and obedience will bring the promised blessing. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Give, that's come first. Give yourself, that comes first. Give your heart, that comes first. Give your time, that comes first. Give your ability, that comes first. Give your love, that comes first. Give your honor, appreciation, glory, give to the Lord, that comes first. Give, 
and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure that ye meet with thou, it shall be measured to you again. I pray that the Lord will help us to be obedient to his word in Jesus' name. I need another amen there. Deuteronomy chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 1. Telling us of the blessings of God that come on condition of obedience to the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. It says, if we are going to be obedient to the word of the Lord, if we shall do everything is commanding us, tithes and offering included, giving of ourselves to the Lord included, then it says, is going to so bless us above and beyond all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee. And shall overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy, of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Look at what the children of Israel were missing by their disobedience. Look at what the children of Israel were missing because of their relegating the word of God to the background. Introducing what God has not introduced. And then abandoning what God has commanded them in the world. And that kind of misplaced priority made them to lose the great things and the wonderful things that the Lord himself had promised them. That's why you sing, return, return unto me. And as we return unto total obedience to the word of God, the blessings of God will be upon our lives in Jesus' name. Then he tells us in verse 5, Blessed shall be the bas thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in. Blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. You know, it's based on obedience to the word of God. You know, there are people, they will, instead of you know, obeying the word of God, they will go into real fasting. Seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 40 days, they're still fasting. Some people are even doing 70 days of fasting. They do it methodically, but they say 70 days. I've been fasting. I, what are they looking for? All the blessings over here in chapter 28 is what they're looking for. And the Lord is saying, it doesn't come by just fasting. It comes by obedience to the word of the Lord. As then we readjust ourselves and return to the Lord. And repent of whatever it is the Lord is correcting in our hearts, in our lives, in our families. Then the blessings of the Lord will come. And the Lord is saying the, the way he's going to kind of defeat our enemies on our behalf is when we're obedient to the word of God. And if Lord says in verse 8, the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto and he shall bless thee in the land which the lord thy god giveth thee the lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as seers one unto thee if thou shalt keep the commandments of the lord thy god and walk in his ways and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. You will not be afraid of them, they will be afraid of you. When you think about the church today, the church, you know, it's like I'm talking about the church at large. That's why they go to all those night vigils and all those conventions and all those uh, meetings they go to, binding the devil and casting out demons and doing this and that and removing these calls and digging up that one and digging up that one. Why? They're afraid. 
instead of the world being afraid of them, instead of the enemies being afraid of them, they are afraid of almost everybody around them. And the Lord is saying, the way to turn everything around so that there's no fear in your life anymore, and you live a life free from fear, free from evil, and free from any oppression, is to be obedient to the word of the Lord. In verse 11, the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods. And in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, and in the fruit of thy land, the, which the Lord thy God swear unto thee, unto thy fathers to give thee, the Lord shall open thee unto thee his good treasure. The heaven to give rain unto the land in a season, and then to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only and shall not be beneath. But look at the condition here. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. We're going to do them. And it's in doing there, we're going to have the blessings of the Lord poured upon our lives. And the blessings are going to be abundant. Come back to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and put me now herewith. Says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you, what? Blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. A time of blessing has started already. On obedience to the word of God, God is going to bless us, open the windows of heaven, and lavish his grace, his favor upon our lives, we will be the word of God. We're going to rise up now, we're going to pray. The pray we're not asking for anything, we're repenting of not being faithful in giving our tithes and offering. We're repenting of not giving ourselves fully and giving our treasures fully, and giving our talents fully, and giving everything we've got fully unto the Lord. We're repenting of that. We're repenting of half-hearted giving unto the Lord, that we have not cheerfully, wholeheartedly given everything we've got to the Lord. We repent of that, because it says, return unto me. It's in that returning, the Lord is going to then open the windows of heaven, is going to shower his abundance upon us. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Have you been stealing from the Lord? The honor that belongs to him, you're stealing it from the Lord. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. The glory that belongs to the Lord, stealing that from the Lord, say to the Lord, I'm sorry. The attention that belongs to the Lord. Instead of allowing other people to give all the attention to the Lord, you want the attention that should be given to the Lord to be given unto you. And you're saying, Lord, I'm sorry for that. Instead of allowing God to be the, the Lord, to be the king, to rule over his people, you want to take it out of the hand of the Lord. You want to rule and take his authority. Away from him. And the Lord is saying, return unto me. We hear the words so as we do it. And stealing the money that belongs to God. Says, return unto me. Repent of that. The tithes, the offering. Let me give an excuse. Because of this, because of that. I cannot give, return unto me. Instead of being obedient to the word, 
We're busy judging the world, judging the preaching, judging the communication, judging the approach. Some of being obedient. Some evidence of backsliding. When you got saved, you didn't judge the world. You obeyed. You repented. You wouldn't have been healed when you were sick. If you were judging the world of faith when it was being preached, you got healed because you believed the world and because you judged the world. And as we hear, first things first. Give me your heart, give me your life to the Lord first, and give me yourself to a life of righteousness and holiness first. As we obey that, the blessings of the Lord will then begin to flow in our lives. When you bring His word as number one, His commandment as number one, what He commands, tithes and offering. Say, Lord, I'm going to be obedient. I want your blessing. I want a prosperity plan to be put in place in my life. That's when the blessing will come. Blessing of prosperity, of success, of strength. Of the ability to stand earnestly contending for the faith, the totality of it, not just tithes and offering, not just tithes and offering, everything. Earnestly contending for the faith, not contending against the faith, not fighting against the faith, against the preaching. Honestly, wholeheartedly, zealously, contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Not contending for opportunity to sing. Contending for opportunity to demonstrate how talented we are. Contending for the word of salvation. The people will be saved. Being obedient to the Lord. Not allowing your obedience to fluctuate. When I'm happy, I obey. When I'm not happy, I don't obey. When I'm happy, I give my best to the Lord. When I'm not happy, and people are not worshipping me, exalting me, knowing that they're up short of the man up there, the woman up there, when they don't show my appreciation of what I have, then I don't obey. No! Obedience to the Lord all the time. All the days of our lives. Submission to the word. Commitment to the word. Fully and wholeheartedly. Yielded to the word of God. That's the evidence of salvation. And if we have anybody there that doesn't show evidence of salvation. Shouldn't be doing anything. As a worker. 
the household of faith. Anybody that is even privately, secretly disobeying the Lord, when we know shall not be serving any area of work. Even your tithes and offering are not needed when you withdraw your heart from the Lord. And of course, if you demonstrate sinfulness, carnality, openly, you're not supposed to be a worker. The Lord only accepts our gifts, our money, our talents, our service, our tithes, our offering. When our heart is in it, when we honor Him, He's not a beggar. He wants us, our heart, our lives, holiness first, righteousness first. Money does not replace. Holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. Tithes and offering, they don't replace righteousness. The Pharisees gave tithes and offering, but they omitted the weightier matters of the law. And the Lord is saying, These such you to have done, yes, bring your tithes, bring the offering. Bring it with your heart, with obedience, with righteousness, with holiness. In appreciation, with gratitude. Bring all the ties into the storehouse. You're born again. If you're not born again, take care of that first. If you're a backslider, take care of that first. You cannot pay money and get to heaven. You cannot give tithes and get to heaven. You cannot give offering and get to heaven. Take care of salvation first. Righteousness first. Obedience to the doctrines of the Bible first. Then after that, bring all the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and put me now herewith. But then I will open the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, so much, that you will not have room enough to receive it. Then I will rebuke the devourers for your sakes. There will be nothing that will destroy your fruit, your vine. You will be so blessed that the nations of the world will know that you are blessed. It will be called a delightsome land. Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength, the strength of your life. Jesus Christ himself has led the example. He gave everything he's got for salvation. In appreciation, all the Lord has done, giving your heart, your life, your talent, your treasures, your resources, everything you have got. And then the blessings of the Lord will be abundant in your life. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Let's raise our hands to the Lord. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. I surrender all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. I surrender. Sing that again. All your heart, all your talents, all your will. All your tithes and offering, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Say that again. said amen our father we thank you at this time for the revelation of your word prosperity does not come by shouting and jumping and screaming and whatever it comes by obedience to your word and lord we come to you now promising you that everything with god spirit soul body everything with god our talents our treasure our time our tithes and offering will surrender and lay at the feet of the lord jesus christ even now in jesus name accept O lord the offering of our heart the offering of our soul, the offering of our body, the offering of our strength, the offering of our talent, the offering of our time, the offering of our tithes, the offering of our money, the offering of our resources unto you in Jesus' name. 
And we pray that we will use everything we have brought to you now. Use them for the propagation of the gospel. For the building of the churches. And for the salvation of souls. In Jesus name. We know you are a faithful God. You will never fail. What you say you are going to fulfill. You said I test in my word to fulfill it. And we pray that the blessing will flow into every one of our lives. In Jesus name. The days of poverty will be over. The days of adversity will be over. The days of famine and scarcity will be over. The days of failure and defeat will be over. And Lord, we pray that as according to your word, you will silence all our enemies in Jesus' name. And the blessings of the Lord from heaven and the blessings of the Lord from all over the earth will flow into our lives in Jesus' name. A new commitment, a new surrender, a new yieldedness, and then a new blessing, a new abundance, a new fruitfulness. Where there has been sickness, there will be health. Where there has been oppression, there will be freedom. Where there has been affliction, there will be dominion in Jesus' name. I will pray that nobody hearing the sound of my voice now will remain in the past poverty and adversity in Jesus' name. Open doors of blessings for everybody. And as we move in in that open door, we pray that this coming new year will be a year of blessing, a year of joy, a year of happiness, and a year of recovering everything we have lost in Jesus' name. Bless your people. Let the blessings overflow. Confirm it, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody praise the Lord. Tell the person by your side, I am blessed. Tell them, days of adversity gone. Tell them, days of poverty gone. I'll give what I have to the Lord. And the Lord will give what he has unto me. I am blessed. Okay, look at me here. Point your, point your hand at me here. Say you are say you me now say you are blessed, Pastor. And then all of you, you are blessed in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. <laughs>